So um, welcome to this event, uh, which is celebrating the release of Reflections magazine. I think you all have now received a, a copy of it, uh, a magazine that in this issue is being uh, used to address the uh, issue of the Millennium Development Goals. And the timing is uh, not accidental. As you know, there's a UN summit going on for the Millennium Development Goals. And President Obama, I am told, made a very important speech on that today. So this is a very timely uh, conversation. Uh, timely because the problems of poverty that the Millennium Development Goals are designed to address uh, are significant. We have in this country, according to the latest census data, 43.6 million, or one in seven Americans, who live in poverty. We have on the global scene 2.6 billion people who live on less than $2 a day. Despite all the advances of the last decade since the Millennium Development Goals were first announced and first embraced, we still have issues to address. It's a time, I think, to take action, a time to be very serious about uh, addressing these goals. Uh, Nelson Mandela was quoted in the New York Times by Bono very recently, saying, sometimes it falls upon a nation to be great. I think it falls on our United Nations to be great and to address these issues. These issues have always been uh, of concern to people of faith. And one of the things that we hope to do through this issue of Reflections and through this distinguished panel tonight is to help faith communities in uh, addressing these issues. Uh, hence, there are no more excuses. It's time to take action on those Millennium Development Goals and to address poverty in a very serious way. We're going to go around and I'm going to uh, introduce uh, members of the panel and ask each a question. And there's one panelist uh, who is delayed and should be here before the end of uh, our session. We'll give her an opportunity, too, to participate. But let me begin with Abigail Nelson, a senior vice president at Episcopal Relief and Development in New York, an Episcopal church agency that works in more than 40 countries. Abigail has given us a remarkable reflection uh, in this issue of Reflections, a meditation on the many forms that poverty takes. Abigail, in your aid work, you've seen some unimaginable conditions and some inspirational successes. In your view, what kinds of approaches to poverty work best? What will it take for the world to eliminate poverty? Well, thank you for inviting me to be part of this panel today and for honoring um, my reflection and for asking me to contribute to this particular issue of reflections. In response to your question, for me, um, the greatest challenge and the greatest opportunity is to put the most vulnerable of us at the center of our program work, at the center of everything that we do. Um, when I think about some of the, the trips I've taken, some of the conversations I've had, um, some of the people who speak to me and through me to us and through us to the world, I think of a woman who lived in a shack made of four pieces of corroborated tin and was caring for her two children in the middle of, a, of a, a geographic area that was about to be bulldozed by the building of a road. Um, one might say that it was progress, that that road was going in and could potentially link um, the others in the community to greater um, access, provide greater access to markets for those people as they move back and forth over that road. Um, for this particular woman, the, the capacity that she had to lean together those four walls and provide a little bit of shelter for her two children um, and the great risk that she was under because that road was going in um, spoke to me about the challenges of addressing development of addressing the people who are at the center of any program that we look at in terms of moving forward with the development. And her voice is the voice that we all have to hold in front of us as we deliberate, as we consider, and as we look at the resources we put into the many things that we do. Thank you very much. Keeping the vulnerable at the center of our attention, very important uh, advice. Thomas Pogge is the Leitner Professor of Philosophy and International Affairs at Yale. His latest book is Politics as Usual, What Lies Behind the Pro-Poor Rhetoric. Uh, Thomas, you've given a lot of sustained thought to the dynamics of poverty and human rights, and you are not terribly impressed by the efforts of the rich nations to reduce poverty. 
What realistic steps should the rich nations take to improve the lives of the poor? Well, I think the first thing to do is to recognize the magnitude of the poverty problem and how we have been concealing it and miscounting it. So just to give you an example, the poverty as defined by the World Bank in terms of a $1.25 PPP poverty line in 2005 dollars converted at purchasing power parity, the poverty problem is roughly one-sixth of 1% 1 of world income. So it's a very, very small problem in economic terms, and that is the problem that the world's governments have committed themselves to eradicating, not exactly to eradicating, but to begin eradicating over a 25-year period. So between 1990 and 2015, we are supposed to reduce that problem by half, not the number of poor exactly, but the proportion of poor people in the population of the developing countries. So if you think about that, a problem the magnitude of which is one-sixth of 1% 1 of world income, the sum of all gross national incomes, and we take 25 years to make a dent into that problem, reduce the number of poor by 27% or the proportion of poor by 50%, that's a ridiculous response. And it's a ridiculous response especially when you realize how huge the problem is in human terms. Roughly one in three people living in this earth will die from poverty-related causes. About 18 million people a year, nine million children under the age of five, another nine million people older are dying from these causes. Now, you spoke about the efforts in your question and should we maybe make greater efforts. I would say that what we need to do first and foremost is do less harm. A lot of the rules that are being imposed at the global level by governments, mainly rich country governments, our kinds of governments, but also with the collaboration of governments in the poorer countries, many of these rules are tremendously harmful to poor people. And if we could just get these harms reduced, then we would do a great amount towards the eradication of poverty. We are facilitating corruption. We are protecting our markets against imports from the poorest of countries. In many different ways that I could multiply, we are harming the global poor, and the income distribution in the world is shifting against the poor. The bottom quarter of the world's population now has 0.76% of global income, of world income, global household income, that is. And that's down by roughly one-third since 1988. So they're struggling with the ever-shrinking share of global income. And so it's not surprising that poverty persists. And of course, it's not surprising that the rules don't reflect the interests of the poor, because the poor are not at the table when these rules are being negotiated. OK. So learning to do less harm and examining the rules by which we live. Peter Singer is professor of bioethics at Princeton, whose latest book is The Life You Can Save, Acting Now to End World Poverty. In Reflections, Professor Singer spells out the ethical mandate we have for coming to the aid of poor people across the world. And he calls for a change in our public ethics to make this happen. So what will it take to produce a groundswell of reform of our spending habits so that individuals and nations have stronger impacts against poverty? And is such reform realistic and pragmatic? Thank you. Um, I think reform is realistic, but it's going to take uh, a lot of hard work and a lot of action from people involved in the anti-global poverty movement. Um, in the book, I talk about some of the psychological barriers that people have to giving, uh, including, for example, the problem that psychologists know as futility thinking. If you think of it as a huge problem, and you say, well, what difference can I make? How can I make a difference to this uh, very large number of people, uh, 1.4 billion or whatever it might be, living in poverty? But uh, if we get people to focus on particular things that work and that achieve success, then I think we can overcome that barrier. And there are a lot of programs that are very effective. I was this morning at a breakfast organized by Save the Children, where I heard Dr. Abe Bang talking about a program that they've instituted starting with pilots in remote tribal regions of India, where uh, without using any qualified doctors, just by educating a literate woman in each village on some fairly elementary practices and giving her a minimal amount of, of equipment, 
um, they've been able to reduce the infant mortality rate from 121 per thousand to 30 per thousand. Um, so you can imagine what that can do in terms of saving lives if spread across India and indeed they're even now piloting in Africa. But they do need more resources. So we have to get people to see that, that you and you and you or perhaps a group of you associated with whatever it might be, um, a church or a community centre or uh, any, any group of people can come together and adopt uh, some specific project that's making a difference, that's working, and I think if we can encourage people to work together and to support each other, because the other psychological fact is people are more likely to give if they know that others are giving. Um, there's a lot more information I'd love to give out. I've got a website, thelifeyoucansave.com. Please go and take a look at that, and there'll be more about it there too. And thanks for that hint on the website for finding some practical projects, uh, ways to get involved in the, addressing the issue. David Beckman is president of Bread for the World a Christian organization that urges the nation's decision makers to end hunger here and abroad. He's also an economist and a Lutheran minister. In recent years, we've endured a world food crisis that increased food prices and increased world poverty. What are the critical issues specifically related to food policy that we need to address? Can the world produce enough food for everyone? I'm actually really encouraged that uh, in this case the U.S. government is, has responded to the increase in world hunger in a remarkably good way. Um, the U.S. government is leading a global mobilization to help poor farmers in developing countries increase their own production. Um, just this week, uh, Hillary Clinton uh, put together a big meeting uh, at the United Nations, governments around the world, to help people know that we have new knowledge about the best ways to reduce child malnutrition. So with existing dollars, we could be making a bigger impact on the death, of, death and disability of children due to malnutrition. So, um, and then I, I we, you know, just an hour before this meeting, President Obama uh, not only made a speech at the United Nations, more importantly, he issued a directive to the whole U.S. government. So for the first time in our history, the U.S. government has a coherent policy to support economic growth and poverty reduction in developing countries. And um, agriculture is one of the emphases that uh, he is encouraging the whole U.S. government to uh, to support. So um, for people of faith, you know, it comes back to us to push, I think it's especially push our members of Congress. In this case, the president's doing some good things, but um, we need to push our own members of Congress to work with the president to provide funding for his World and Hunger Initiative, to work with the president to make our foreign aid more effective. And our website is bread.org. So if people want to help push Congress on issues that affect hungry and poor people in our country and around the world, it's bread.org, or at least that's one place you can go. Well, thank you for the next website. <laughs> <laughs> we'll get a lot of uh, good links, I think, out of this. Uh, Willis Jenkins, you are the Margaret Farley Assistant Professor of Social Ethics at Yale Divinity School with international experience in development initiatives. And you're the author of Ecologies of Grace, Environmental Ethics and Christian Theology. You call in your Reflections article for a redefinition of real wealth to include biodiversity and ecological integrity. Who will lead the way in that? Who will make such a fundamental reevaluation of wealth happen? Can people of faith have a realistic role in that project? Well, I think already leading the way are um, a number of those people who are responding to their ecological vulnerability. I'm, um, I'm impressed by how many projects and communities there are around the world who are um, pressing for environmental justice, uh, for environmental rights, or for initiatives in sustaining community. And I, I think that you know, the sum moral from those various initiatives may be that there are environmental dimensions of human dignity. Uh, Sometimes that may be quite minimal when a community is, is um, attempting to protect itself from ecologically mediated harms like toxins. Sometimes it's a bit more when um, a community is uh, requesting a right to a sustaining resource like water. And, but the most interesting are where there are communities that are 
um, maintaining that there is a, a dignity, a dignity providing relationship in access to biodiversity or to the web of ecological life. And some of the most interesting here have been uh, the, the recent uh, quite outspoken witness from councils of indigenous peoples, including some Christian councils of indigenous peoples on climate justice. And um, their witness there is that climate driven degradations, including loss of biodiversity, erodes a great treasure of many cultures. Um, and and that, that treasure is a sacred trust to know and respect the earth and its creatures. Um, so when, biodiversity, when we suffer biological impoverishments, um, we suffer more than the erosion of biological wealth. We suffer, these, these councils have been saying, an erosion of uh, our own human dignity. And so I, I, I suppose I take heart and interest and um, ask for our moral and theological imaginations to be fired by, these, by the ecologically vulnerable and the attempts to, um, I wouldn't say redefine, but recover um, a, a sense of real wealth. Okay, thank you for especially introducing that uh, ecological dimension to our conversation. Uh, Arthur Keyes is president of the International Relief and Development uh, Organization based in Arlington, Virginia, also a UCC minister and a YDS grad. Uh, Art, you're a leader in the development world and you have theological training. So my question is, are American people of faith uh, realizing their potential in the fight against poverty? Are churches fully engaged in the poverty debate and the fate of the Millennium Development Goals? Well, I think uh, I would be a little bit careful at uh, the Yale Divinity School Forum to, uh, to make too many comments about the state of the church and the faith organizations. Uh, but I think uh, theologically, I think we'd have to say no, churches are not fully engaged. I don't think there's any problem with that. There's certainly much more potential. Uh, I think that uh, my own personal view is that uh, uh, it's, it's kind of interesting, but a lot of the kind of uh, mainline uh, mission agencies uh, are weaker, I believe, than the, they used to be. I don't think we have the spirit of uh, missionary zeal, I guess, of, of previous generations. Uh, we have a lot of uh, parachurch organizations like Bread for the World, like uh, Catholic Relief Services and, and Islamic Relief, uh, et cetera, that are they're fairly active, World Vision. Uh, but I think, uh, you know, the, at least the, uh, the faith tradition that I'm part of is not as actively engaged, uh, I think, as it was a generation ago. Um, I think the opportunity is there. It's kind of interesting that there are a lot of major agencies, uh, like, say, the children was mentioned, the, the president of International Rescue Committee is a YDS graduate, George Rupp. Um, I'm a YDS graduate in International Relief and Development. And our website, of course, is IRD.org. <laughs> um, <laughs> And uh, Neil Kenny Geyer uh, is on the Yale Corporation uh, as a man of faith, uh, heads up Mercy Corps. Uh, I think there's a great opportunity for church agencies to link with some of the uh, non-sectarian agencies uh, to have greater uh, impact. I think, um, you know, this is a, a classic uh, religious uh, issue. That how do you minister? Do you minister one-to-one? -one? Do you minister congregation to congregation? Uh, we certainly, pastors have a lot of experience in that, and a lot of, a, a, a lot of congregations are linked up, for instance, with congregations in Haiti. But my uh, uh, analysis would be that if you want to have a large impact on large social problems like the Millennium Challenge goals, you have to deal with larger scale programs, and you have to deal with government funds, and governments uh, have to be part of the solution. So I think that uh, perhaps the, uh, some of the large uh, NGOs could be a link uh, between the faith communities and the larger uh, agencies uh, uh, like, uh, and also some of the UN agencies like UNICEF. Okay, interesting suggestions about the linking function of NGOs. We'll probably come back to that as we think about uh, the practicality of uh, addressing things through our government connections. Um, Christiana Peppard, you're a Yale PhD candidate fo focusing on the fate of fresh water in an era of globalization. Uh, you also have an MAR from YDS. So how have issues of uh, water and poverty changed or sharpened your own sense of vocation? The first thing to say is that I don't have a website, but I am speaking about <laughs> networks in a sense. So forgive the pun. Water undergirds everything. That's the beginning and the end of the work that I do. Gender equity, child mortality, economic development, health, local ag agricultural practices, 
basic survival, to name only a few. All of these rely on the availability of clean, fresh water and its counterpart, sanitation. The reverse is also true. These things shape water, how we govern, how we grow our food, what kind and where, how we facilitate or block economic exchange, how we communicate with whom to what ends, how we consume, and so on. Unfortunately, we too often fail to see these kinds of connections. So think of poverty in terms of fresh water. What if you don't have it? Here, poverty is a lack. It's an absence, an absence that shapes lives. If you don't have water, you will spend most of your day trying to get it or sending someone else to get it for you. Control of bodies. Fresh water reminds us in ways that gross domestic product or per capita income do not, that thirst and hunger and strife are written on us. They are written on bodies. And these are moral issues, of course. So I would say, Harry, to your question that exploring these kinds of connections is my vocation thus far. Uh, I ask questions like, what are we beginning to see that we have not before seen, and why not? What has obscured our vision? Why do pernicious paradigms persist? Are there constructive alternatives? None of this is simple. Water is never, ever, ever simple. But it is basic and it is essential. So I think of my work in this realm as the ongoing challenge of discernment. And perhaps that's a pragmatist's hope, but therein is the challenge and the vocation. So getting the eyes to see the problems that uh, are in front of us and uh, opening up to the possibilities is an important part of what we all should be doing. Debbie McLeod Sears, you're a recent YDS grad, a wife and mother in Houston, Texas, who also has much experience abroad in doing work with the poor, whether in orphanages or in other initiatives. In Reflections, you candidly chronicle your own evolving perspective on how to bear witness to the issue of poverty. What do you see now as the best strategy for reducing global po poverty? And what advice do you offer uh, other lay people who might feel overwhelmed by the scope of poverty but want to do something about it? The best strategy to reduce or end poverty is not always completely financially sustainable. The word is thrown around a lot with regards to poverty reduction as if it is essential. It is not. Donors can be and should be used to ease poverty-related suffering and support individual agency along with bottom-up programs. The best strategy to reduce or end poverty is always multi-focused. There is no one answer. A good example is the founding and functioning of great schools in the developing world. A good school may be financed by a microloan or a small business loan, which is accompanied by business and education training. A well may be dug to provide water for the school and to sell the water to the community to help maintain the well as well as the school. Breakfast and lunch may be served to children and including earth care in your curriculum also finishes the multifaceted effect. Any effective poverty reduction program must include equipping and empowering all to question authority and to use critical thinking skills to question government abuses and their current social order. I long to see billboards in the developing world that read question authority rather than advertise skin bleaching cream. Most paid employees of NGOs were laypersons at one time, so don't under underestimate your value just because you aren't paid. Actually, not being paid gives you more of an ability to speak truth to power because you don't have a boss to answer to. Eunice Kennedy Shriver was a layperson when she helped found the Special Olympics. The more you learn about poverty and suffering, the more overwhelmed you will be if you have a brain and a heart. The areas of my life that have been most personally transformative were the areas in which I felt initially ill-equipped. I believe that we are hardwired by God for service. 
giving money to a soup kitchen, kitchen will never replace making the soup, getting to know the volunteers and the diners, and doing the dishes when you are finished. I have a website, grantmethewisdom.org and .com, which is empty, so don't go there. But at some point, there will be something there. <laughs> okay, thank you. Uh, the importance of um, multi-focused uh, approaches to solving poverty and uh, the importance of critical analysis and engaging what some of the uh, causes of poverty are. Melinda St. Louis is Deputy Director of Jubilee USA, an alliance of 75 denominations and other groups that work for cancellation of debt for poor nations. Uh, Melinda, you make the case that debt forgiveness of poor nations makes a difference. Does it work? Is debt forgiveness now one of the world's respected weapons in the fight against poverty, or is it still controversial and does it meet resistance? Well, I also am very humbled to be on this panel with everyone else. Uh, debt cancellation is actually, an, I believe, an example of a success of faith-based organizing. Uh, this was in the mid-90s. Uh, faith groups came together to say, you know, we really need to address not only giving aid to countries, but also address the flow out of those countries in, in, in the form of debt payments to rich nations. And debt cancellation has been an important tool to fight poverty. It adds poverty reduction expenditures by subtraction, by subtracting the amount that's coming out of those countries. And we now have a 10-year track record. Uh, we were successful in convincing world leaders to make some really important commi political commitments in 1999 and then 2005. And now we've seen some positive results. If, for example, in Tanzania, there were 1.2, 1.5 million children that were able to go to school after they received debt cancellation. In Ghana, they were able to build 268 new classrooms, 36 new health clinics, for example. And in Africa, for every debt relief dollar they've received, they've been able to invest $2 in social spending. So this has been a, a, a very important tool, and it's also helped countries uh, create the political sp policy space they needed during the economic crisis. Some, of, some were actually able to increase social spending when they wouldn't have been able to if that money had been tied up in debt payments. But and when we started talking about debt cancellation, it was completely off the table. It was told we were told it couldn't be done, and David Beckman was very much a part of that of that initial um, that initial movement. But now world leaders actually hold up their role in the multilateral debt relief initiative as a, as a form of pride. This is something that we have done. We were told they couldn't do it before, and then after faith leaders organized, they, they agreed that, that they could and they have done it. But it is an unfinished agenda. There are still many countries, there are 20 countries that are very poor that were completely left out of um, debt relief deals, and some of the underlying structures that, w that held were not changed. Um, underlying structures that of conditions that were placed on loans and debt relief um, and, and the fact that irresponsible lending and borrowing has continued. So we want to continue that. But I, in terms of whether it is still controversial, I think there are pieces of it that are. Um, the, when we begin to talk about the legitimacy of the debts, actually holding lenders responsible also for making bad loans um, to uh, two countries, that they don't really want to talk so much about that. So we need to continue to push, um, push that agenda. But generally, it has been something that is recognized as, um, as, as important for fighting poverty. OK, thank you very much. And we've been joined now by Catherine Marshall. Welcome. Uh, Catherine is a senior fellow at the Georgetown University's Berkeley Center for Religion, Peace, and World Affairs, and director of uh, World Faiths Development Dialogue. And this after many years with the World Bank and much experience in development issues. In reflections, you identify various trends that suggest we've arrived at a historic moment, a realization that poverty el elimination is now a reachable dream as well as an ethical imperative. What gives you hope that we can stay on the task and keep our resolve despite all the politics and inertia and bad, bad news? <coughs> The most extraordinary progress has been made uh, in our lifetimes uh, in seeing a dramatic change uh, in the lives of billions of people. And what that shows is what can be done. Even in my own professional career, 
Uh, I remember the stories of the reports, the technical reports on the hopelessness of countries like Singapore uh, and Ireland, which were seen as uh, countries which could never go anywhere. Uh, we've seen how dramatically and how quickly the fate of nations can change. And in the difficult world of statistics, we see the dramatic increase in lifespan, the reductions in infant mortality. So we know that it can be done. Uh, we also know, uh, and it doesn't take very much, uh, many people have pointed out how much money was mobilized, how quickly for the stimulus plan, uh, how much is spent on military budgets, tiny fractions of those resources, if they were well applied, uh, could bring an end to the worst forms of poverty. So we have this situation of knowing that it can be done, uh, knowing that we have the resources, and that I think gives an imperative uh, which we've never had in human history, because through most of human history, poverty was inevitable. It was a part of life. Most people were poor, and now we know that that's different. Uh, it doesn't make it easier. Uh, it doesn't, um, educating one child is hard enough. Educating the world's children is an enormous challenge. Uh, reducing maternal mortality, ending disease, nothing is, simply a stroke of the pen or a speech or an act of will. It requires the kind of organization and passion and commitment uh, that, that we've seen in some instances. Uh, but the fact is that there is a commitment, that's the historic commitment of the Millennium Declaration in the year 2000. The sincere effort to bring the best tools that we have of discipline, of accounting, of accountability, of deadlines, of measurement, of, uh, of standards. Uh, so we have really a historic engagement, a historic promise. Uh, and, and that, I think, is grounds for, for enormous hope. I'd like to follow up with a question that will be directed to the whole of the panel. Uh, I'd like you to perhaps uh, give us the first response to it. Uh, what we've heard so far is, uh, yes, messages of, of hope, uh, a call for some critical analysis, an analysis of what things do harm, um, a call to raise our consciousness and to be focused on those who are most vulnerable, uh, a call to find practical ways of getting involved in specific circumstances and projects to relieve poverty, and also a call to lobby, either directly or indirectly, uh, through organizations devoted to poverty relief. Um, ben Ki-moon, in the uh, opening to the summit, said we should not balance the budgets on the backs of the poor. We must not draw back from official development assistance, a lifeline of billions for billions. So uh, the question that I have now is, uh, can we be optimistic or pessimistic that we, we can make significant progress on the Millennium Development Goals in the next five years? Uh, the goal is to reach certain levels by 2015. Uh, what are the obstacles to reaching those goals and how do we address them? Catherine, could you begin and anybody else can then chime in. To me, the goal of ending the worst forms of poverty, of misery, of people going to bed hungry, of deaths that can easily be prevented, Maternal mortality 2,000 times in Niger, what it is uh, in Europe. Uh, it's morally not only straightforward. I think it's morally absolutely compelling. Uh, so there's, um, there is the, at least a, a moral clarity there. Uh, those of us who've worked in the development field know very well that it is very complicated. Uh, if it were simply a question, of mobilizing and directing money, uh, that would, in some senses, be an easy task. Uh, it requires a sensitive, thoughtful, determined, uh, organized effort to, uh, to mobilize uh, the resources of countries and the passion and the commitment of the people concerned, as well as those who have the resources. 
And one of the things that I find troubling in this is not that there is debate, because debate is what we should be doing. We should have an active exchange about what works, learning the lessons of the past. Uh, but the lack of engagement, and I'd be very interested in hearing other members of the panel that uh, there is um, a sort of a soundbite culture, that, that there has to be uh, a simple answer, that one, uh, one problem can detract from that. So I think we need to find a way, and I think this is one of my hopes for the kind of engagement with the broad-based religious community that, that is uh, driven by the ethical uh, concerns, that, that we can find better ways to debate whether microcredit is truly more important than uh, nutrition supplements, or what is the best way uh, to deal with the problems of education. That, uh, that, it, that disagreement uh, is an important part of the process, but that it should not paralyze us. So I think that's, that's the challenge that we have in the next not only in the next five years, and I, I think we also need to dream bigger uh, because 2015 is not the end. Uh, 2015, in a sense, is simply a marker. And I'm hopeful that we can see enough clarity and have enough engagement, intellectual and practical, that we can truly uh, find ways to, to look beyond. I mean, my sense is if you combine the fire of the idea, which everybody who came here tonight and everyone who's devoted their life's work to engaging, which is that we can end world poverty. So there's the fire of this emotional idea with all of the uh, statistics, intellectual discussion, I don't know, zillions of papers and speeches that are out there. You can build alliances with those who are like-minded we can do a great deal. And I think, you know, you, you just shared over the past generation many things that have happened. I mean, we think of Singapore, we think of Ireland, we think of, you know, Vietnam. You think of what's happened in China, I mean, which has lifted a billion people out of poverty in one country alone by change. And you, can, you say to yourself, well, what can happen over the next five years? I mean, I review what's happened over the past five when it's come to the malaria prevention discussion. I mean, any of us here involved in public health think about what's happened in terms of building alliances with rollback malaria between the faith communities and the corporate communities and governments. And we've been able to affect huge amounts of change just over the past month, the largest uh, net distribution and hanging program in history happened in Ghana, and the faith community, the Anglican Church of Ghana was at the center of that. So I, I, I truly believe that the faith community is critical. I believe each, each and every one of us in the pews and in these fora are critical. Again, I, what I really believe is that we need to lift the visibility up about the good things that are happening and create positive energies that people want to join and be part of. And in just as much in our statistical analysis of what are the critical problems, we address statistical analysis and we lift up the stories of what are actually extraordinary successes that are happening out there. Otherwise, we all just feel tremendously depressed and pull up our tents and go home. <laughs> oh. David. I'm, I'm just profoundly hopeful because hundreds of millions of people have escaped from extreme poverty over the last 20 years. We've ne I mean, more could have happened, more could be done. But this is an extraordinary liberation. And for, you know, when I look at that, what's happened, and I believe in God, this is God moving in our history. This is our loving God answering the prayers of hundreds of millions of people. Uh, it mostly, you know, the work is being done by those people for their kids. Uh, but the fact that we have seen countries like Bangladesh and Ethiopia and Ghana Brazil, Britain, reduce poverty. This, to me, this is, this is the great, this, the liberation that is taking place, that can take place from poverty is the great exodus of our time. It makes what happened at the Red Sea look like small potatoes. It is huge. Uh, and in our own country, the reason why Americans don't get it is because in our own country, we cut poverty in half in the 60s and early 70s, but since then we have not achieved sustained progress against poverty. 
But if Bangladesh and Britain can do it, do we think it's not possible in the USA? Of course it's possible. And I think God is longing to uh, realize the liberation that's so clearly possible and that it's people of, God's calling people of faith to get off the couch and partly to change politics as usual. So all there are lots of different ways for us to be involved. But we're not going to see the progress against poverty and hunger that's possible if we don't change politics as usual. Well, I also am hopeful, but to be a bit provocative, I also might sound a little bit like a wet blanket here because I also, while I think that the Millennium Development Goals can be achieved, I think we can cut extreme poverty, I think that we have it in our power if we organize, I think that this summit that happened here the last three days was not the breakthrough plan that was needed. Um, I, I am, I was disappointed because I felt that that there were there were a lot of important uh, statements that were made, uh, recognitions of past promises. I think it's important that the Millennium Development Goals are still on the table after 10 years and that people know what they are, but there weren't there weren't concrete commitments that were made. I in in, in my opinion, there were there in terms of for especially for the developed world to to recognize that there has been progress made but there was a financial crisis that started on Wall Street that had repercussions across the entire world and that that the progress that was made a lot of it has gone backwards because of the food crisis because of the fuel crisis and because of this financial crisis and the and the climate crisis that is growing um, and that the developed countries took up disproportionate atmospheric space over many years and contributed to climate change and it's the poor that are feeling the effects of that and and i didn't see the urgency from world leaders to to really make that take that next step and um and to and to pay back the debt that are that developed countries owe to uh, to the world's poor and so so to me it's a galvanizing call of you know we are able to to organize we've made great change but i in order to feel optimistic we need to really hold our elected leaders feet to the fire on this and we and it's not going to happen with without that hey thank you Thomas. Yeah, I'm also on the wet blanket team, I'm sorry to say. <laughs> and a first reality check. The FAO, the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations, announced in 2009 that for the first time in all of human history, there were more than a billion people chronically undernourished. That's reliable information, that's interesting. So there hasn't been, at the global level, a lot of progress. We are now down to 925 million, as they announced a few days ago. So that's progress. But basically, in all the years from the 90s to 2009, there was rising uh, poverty as measured in terms of chronic undernutrition, or at least it was flat, but basically a rising tendency. It was uh, around 800 million in the 1990s. The World Bank presents positive statistics, rosy statistics about the number of poor going down. Uh, half of my book is about how these numbers are manufactured, and you better read that before you are too optimistic and at least get the other side of the story. One thing that I can tell you is that according to the World Bank's own numbers, if you take a reasonable poverty line of $2.50 per person, per day, more reasonable, it's not still not uh, sufficient to meet human needs, but if you take the $2.50 poverty line, you find that even according to the World Bank statistics, poverty has gone up. The number of poor people has gone up since 1990. So I think don't look at these complicated, convoluted PPP calculations. Look at how many people are hungry, and you'll get a good sense of what's happening on the ground with regard to poverty. One more point, if I may, and that is this. There are millions of success stories. So I agree with what you have all said. There are many, many people doing good work, thousands and thousands of NGOs, thousands of good stories of progress. And the remarkable thing is that things are getting worse despite all these successes. 
So there are much larger forces at work against the poor than all these wonderful good forces in favor of the poor. I want to give you one example of the forces that are at work against the poor. You know how much development aid goes into the poor countries every year? It's about $120 billion. Of that, $15.5 billion goes for basic social services. That is to say, it goes for basic needs of people. The rest goes for all sorts of other stuff, more of interest to rich exporters or rich elites in the developing countries than to poor people. But do you know how much money flows out of poor countries illicitly? About a trillion dollars, a thousand billion dollars, dwarfs all development assistance. How does that flow out? Well, in many ways, but here are two, the most important. The first is embezzlement. Officials in poor countries steal a lot of money, not just people at the very top, but all the way down, and they park it into bank accounts in the West, including this country. A lot of it goes to this country into secret personal bank accounts. In the United States, when you come and you've stolen money and your bank knows that, it's perfectly legal for the bank to accept that money, and so it is in many other, most other Western countries. If you make your money with drugs, you can't deposit. If you make your money right with, with drugs, you can't deposit the money. If you do it with terrorist activities, you can't deposit the money. These are the two exceptions where banks have to be wary. But if you make your money trafficking children or stealing from your home government or something like that, your money is welcome here, it's welcome in Switzerland, welcome in Germany, welcome in the Cayman Islands, Bermuda, and so on and so forth. So that's a lot of money flowing out. Another even larger chunk of money flows out through tax avoidance schemes where corporations misprice trade within the corporation or within their subsidiaries where they, for example, produce something in India, sell it in South Africa, just a random example. They sell it cheaply to their subsidiary in the Cayman Islands, so sorry, there's no profit in India. Then they sell it expensively from the Cayman Islands to South Africa, so sorry, there's no profit in South Africa. But there's a lot of profit in the Cayman Islands. Why? It's only a guy with a telephone. The goods never go there. Nobody ever produces anything there or sells it there. Why is there a lot of profit there? Well, that's where the tax rates are lowest. So again, hundreds of billions of dollars are lost to poor countries through these shenanigans of corporations. There is a lot of good work, billions of dollars worth, tens of billions of dollars worth. There is a lot of progress stories where a good project here, a good project there. But all that good work is blowing against a tornado, a much stronger headwind against the poor. So the point that I'm making is not poverty eradication. When you think about avoiding poverty, it's not a matter of doing a lot to eradicate poverty. But a lot is being done to keep the poor poor. And that we have to understand, that if there weren't this enormous headwind against the poor, then they would rise along with the average income in the world at a pace, and poverty would long have gone. The poor are not get participating proportionately in global economic growth. In a 17-year period, they lost fully one-third of their share of global household consumption income, I mean, uh, global household income. Okay, and I think we'll have to take that as a, a good warning uh, the, uh, for some of the other things that we need to be paying attention to, uh, the forces that are working against the poor. Uh, two over on this side, Christy Peppard and N.R. Keys. Christy. I think that one of the theological insights brought to this kind of discussion is that there are always multiply nuanced realities, hope and despair, good and evil. No one thing is ever entirely one or the other. And um, it sometimes helps me to keep this in mind when thinking about the problems of global poverty, <clears throat> pardon me, and the suffering that people endure in those kinds of contexts. Um, Dr. Pogge has a, a great line that he referenced, which is making headway into headwinds, which I think is a very important image because yes, there is progress, but what are the forces running against us as well? And this is something that as an ethicist, as someone who thinks about morality and action and responsibility under conditions of globalization, especially economic globalization, that we have to take really, really seriously. Um, 
again, quoting Dr. Pogi, and I promise we have never met before, actually, so this is a great delight for me. But um, he points out that contributing to this situation are choices, individual choices, choices, scale it up a level, policies of states and so forth, and also global economic institutions and structures. All of these things shape the way that wealth and, and um, power and ability and access are navigated under conditions of globalization. And that, to me, poses significant questions of moral responsibility, of complicity, of who we are and how we act for the greater good. So to Melinda's point, yes, we need to organize, but what then does effective collective action look like? It's not merely charity, though that's important. It's not merely lobbying your legislators, though that too is important. It also includes taking a deep, deep look at these institutions, and by institutions I mean arrangements of political economy uh, that permeate the global context in the present day, to see how power, wealth, money, all, all these things flow, and with what kinds of predictable consequences. How we throw a cog in those that's a big question. Okay, an important challenge, Art. Uh, I always try to uh, avoid being either optimist or a uh, pessimist and try to think of myself as a realist. Uh, but I think one major issue that hasn't been put on the table here, and that's the uh, politics. Uh, a major uh, constraint here of economic progress uh, is political uh, conflict and particularly wide-scale war. Uh, some of us are uh, old enough uh, to remember the stories of world wars, of tens of millions of people being killed, of tens of millions of people being refugees. Many people in this room, I'm sure, were affected uh, by that. Uh, I spent a lot of my professional life uh, in Bosnia, my wife's family from Bosnia, and I can tell you, civil society can snap overnight and social upheaval, religious conflict, political conflict can come out overnight. So I think if we're look, thinking about the next five years and making progress on the Millennium Challenge goals, we have to know if there's going to be a major warfare uh, and, and the, is there going to be a political breakdown here. Sudan is a, a good example of everything is in the, in the balance. That country could have tremendous economic growth and development if there is no warfare. And if churches play a positive and religious institutions a positive and not a negative role, and, but I think the question is, is there, and it's not clear which way it's going to go. Okay. We're coming close to the end of our time for formal interaction, and I know um, uh, the panel would like to have some uh, time to chat with you individually and perhaps to get a glass of wine. But what I want to do is to have uh, everybody on the panel have one final word, so a 30-second <coughs> soundbite, and we'll start at this end. So what, what should we take away? Well, for me, I would say that, that the Millennium Development Goals are, are an important tool, uh, but when we're talking about poverty, to me, we need to move beyond specific goals and benchmarks and actually start talking about economic justice. And that, and that, that piece is, is ex extraordinarily important. I think that as long as the structures exist, that for example, that created the financial crisis. I think that was a clarion call that we have a limited earth, we have limited resources, and we cannot continue a casino type uh, um, way of just profits, 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 profits over people. And that we need to actually change those structures. And if we're really going to address uh, poverty and, and really build up uh, human dignity. Debbie? Um, I believe there are two areas that are being ignored. Uh, most NGOs focus on children's education, which is Millennium Development Goal number two. But in Ghana, parents ask for even, evening literacy classes in their children's school. They will be much better parents and can much more of easily question authority if they are literate. What needs to be said is that I believe that Muhammad Yunus was wrong when he said the poor only need a loan to work their way out of poverty. Microloan efficacy has recently become the subject of much academic research, which is showing that long-term transformation may not be statistically significant for most borrowers. We have been unable to find any academic study that shows that microfinance without education 
has any long-term effect in raising the poor above a subsistence level. Like any business owner, the poor need to be literate, have financial and business skill training, and most importantly, be able to use critical thinking skills to make assessments. What needs to be said by the church about poverty is that being that is not being said is that God does not intend for poverty and suffering to exist, and it accomplishes nothing in God's plan. Christ spent a great deal of time, according to the Gospels, healing the sick and feeding the hungry. People suffer all over the world because of choices that rich and middle class Americans make every day. To give you an example, every time you buy bottled water, rather than using a platypus, which is what I use, my New Year's resolution was to not buy bottled water. This folds up and I keep it in my purse and I never have to buy bottled water. You are supporting large international water companies who go into the developing world, purchase water at rock bottom prices, while the citizens in those developing countries pay much higher inflated prices. You, every time you buy a bottle of water, are doing that. You individually, not somebody else. What is not being said is that the disconnect between what Americans do and what happens to the poor must be exposed and ended. Okay, thank you. Christy. I have two points. The first can be summarized is everything connects to everything else, but that doesn't mean we should just give up. Uh, more formally, negative feedback cycles in global economic arrangements need a lot more attention, particularly how arrangements of political economy, the way our societies and our modes of exchange and governance are structured, how those interact with environmental realities and specifically environmental resource degradation, because as Willis and, and others and I have pointed to, without some kind of environmental integrity, you don't have much. You spend your life just trying to survive on a very desiccated land, for example. Uh, so how arrangements of political economy, environmental factors, and poverty mutually interrelate and what can be done about those. Um, the second point is a bit more of a moral theory, sort of theological idea, and that's moral responsibility in a complex world. So doctors Singer and Pogge have written quite elegantly and importantly about questions of harm and responsibility. They are among the very few to do so in a way um, that is captured in journalism as being thought leaders. So it, these questions are easier for us to shirk because they're hugely uncomfortable, right? Who likes to be told by Debbie that we are impacting people in, in other countries negatively every time we buy bottled water? Incidentally, I agree. Um, <laughs> So, but the point is basic, that economic globalization raises these huge questions because the realities are not just out there. It's not just a problem of corrupt governments, though that can also be a contributing factor. These realities refract back onto us. They shape us. So these are questions of responsibility. They are also questions of ontology, of who we understand ourselves to be and who we are. And that does not get enough of a hearing. Hey, thank you. Art. Well, I think uh, one of the uh, questions which is often left out of the debate on the MDGs is uh, the fact that I believe that we have to do development in conflict zones. I think that uh, people uh, often look at this chronologically that you have peace and then you have development, but I think uh, the world is more complex than that, so I believe you have to have development as you're working towards peace. Uh, people, uh, uh, if your mandate is to deal with the least of these, uh, the least of these are people who are caught up uh, uh, through often no uh, fault of their own in conflict areas. So I think uh, that's a, a real challenge for us to do uh, if we want to get our hands dirty and really get into the fray. I'll give you an example. My organization just this last year distributed one million tree uh, samplings to farmers in southern uh, Afghanistan, in Helmand and Kandahar province, where there's active warfare going on. But what happened there? These, these farmers got back into uh, production. They produced food. They produced cash. Uh, they re uh, received tractors for their co-ops. They received uh, fertilizer. They, re they received pruning equipment, which increased the pomegranate uh, crop uh, tremendously. 
And when they got a stake into, into their uh, being able to control their own lives again, they pushed back the Taliban. And they, they, they got beyond the conflict areas and got back into uh, semblance of uh, a more normal uh, society. So I think that's a big thing that uh, we have to do. And uh, you know, I think the challenge of us uh, as development professionals and of religious people, if we're going to uh, make a serious dent on the Millennium uh, Development Goals, we have to be involved in nation building. I know that's a, a politically kind of charged comment, but uh, I'll uh, expose myself as a closet Calvinist. I think religion is about building nations, and religion is a building block of, uh, <coughs> uh, but, the, but my plea is that religion teach tolerance, teach the value of all people, and teach, uh, allow people to live uh, in harmony with differences. Hi. Willis. Right, and in my, um, in my response to your opening question, I, I pointed out that there are in environmental dimensions of human development, and, um, and I, I, I would have elaborated that I think that there are um, rich resources within Christian traditions for, um, uh, for developing those connections. Um, at the very least, we might say that the, the poor will not be blessed if they inherit the kingdom of God without the creatures of God, or um, the meek will not be blessed if they inherit a devastated earth. And um, I think that there are, there are, there are wonderful eco-theological resources, and there are, uh, there are great communities doing many things. Um, just today, um, churches in the United Kingdom were ringing their bells for biodiversity. And um, um, I think what I want to say is that um, those bells toll not only for the creatures that are being lost, but for our own souls as well. But I want to leave you um, with, with a, a slightly different final point. And, that is that our responses to human poverty are in an era of massive human power over the earth, also de facto an ecological management plan. Like it or not, how we respond to poverty is reshaping the earth. And um, that means that we have to respond to poverty in imaginative and beautiful and creative ways. I'm not just delivering packets of resources and calories, right? Um, which is to say that there are not just environmental dimensions of human development, but that human development is quickly becoming the environment for all humans and all other creatures. Okay, thank you. David. Well, <clears throat> my summing up would be that God's calling us to change the politics of poverty. Uh, there are, the issues that we've been discussing here tonight are all being discussed in the U.S. Congress. This is, you know, this is not, these are real choices that our country is making right now. There are really important issues for poor people in this country, for poor people around the world that are being decided by the US Congress now. So, you know, this is not an academic exercise. Relatively small groups of people can change the politics of the United States and in that process, reduce poverty in our country and reduce poverty around the world. Um, this is an election year, so it's not only advocacy for who's sitting in Congress, but everybody who hears this should just do one thing different to get a candidate elected to Congress who gives a damn about poverty. Just God doesn't need us to do everything. Just take one step to change the elections of November for poor people. And uh, you know, I think, I think God can can use people of faith to, to turn the direction of the world and to open up lots of opportunity for poor people in our country and all over the world. Hey, thank you. Peter. Thank you. Well, since I'm addressing an audience from a divinity school, which is not my, my usual territory, let me say that um, I think the religious institutions and perhaps the Christian churches in particular have really failed uh, to convey a, a serious ethical message, which I would take to be, as I read, the Gospels and uh, the, the principal method, uh, message of them, which is that really, if you're not doing something substantial for the poor, you're not living an ethical life. And I find a huge amount of complacence uh, in the United States and uh, among Christians too, that they think that if they just don't do certain things and if they vote the right way on some issues, um, then they're nice, decent, ethical people. Um, I think that's what needs to change. I think we really need to get people to see both that they're contributing perhaps to the sort of harms that uh, Thomas has been talking about in various ways, and I'd add the climate change one to that too, 
Um, but also that um, you know, we can share, it's no huge sacrifice to give 5 or 10% of our income at least um, to organisations that are fighting poverty. And if we did that and we chose effective organisations to give to, it would make a huge difference to hundreds of millions of people. And I'm not sure why that message is not really being put forward uh, a lot more forcefully than it is, unless it's just that Christians, like anyone else, are comfortable living a luxurious life and they're happy to go on doing that and never mind what the ethics of it really seriously are. Very good. Yeah, so I make two points. First, I think what we need very urgently is an honest accounting of how many poor people there are and what our goal is with regard to those people. We've promised to halve poverty by 2015 three times. The first time we've said we half the number of hungry and poor people between 1996 and 2015. That was the World Food Summit in Rome. The second time in the Millennium Declaration, we said we half the percentage of poor people in world population between 2000 and 2015. The third time in the first millennium, in the Millennium Development Goals, we backdated to the baseline of 1990 and said we will half the proportion of poor people in the population of the developing countries between 1990 and 2015. Now, you won't be able to remember that, but here's what you can remember. How many poor people, extremely poor people, are morally acceptable in the year 2015? According to the first promise, 828 million. According to the last promise, 1,324 million. The difference is 500 million people, or 6 million dead people per annum in the years following 2015. Now this was done very cleverly. The notion of halving world poverty was maintained, but the meaning of that halving of world poverty was changed two times in order to dilute our promise. So that's important. The second point that's important is that we have to look at global institutional factors that blow a headwind against the poor, as I said. I give you one more factor reminded by my colleague over on the other side about conflict and politics. There's a lot of conflict and a lot of very bad government in many of the poor countries. One very important reason of that is that we accept and recognize any person or group exercising effective power in one such country as entitled to sell the natural resources of that country, to borrow money in the name of the country that the people then have to repay, to sign treaties in the name of the country, and to import weapons in the name of the country that, of course, they then use to maintain themselves in power. This rule that we are willing to recognize any such person or group on the basis of power alone, regardless of how they came to power and regardless of how they exercise it, is again a very important factor in explaining why poverty is persisting despite a very nicely rising average income in the world. Thank you. Abigail. I guess my final word is that I believe that the statistics and the discussion that we've had about the structures of political economy are extremely important. But when it comes to spiritual warfare, these are important from the sense of know thy enemy. Understand what are the forces that we're working with, um, that we're attempting to engage. As a people of God, we, we need to be a people of hope. And so let's not allow those statistics and those, the, the power of those hurricane winds to stop us from engaging and to pushing as, into what are those circles of power. Every single one of us in here is probably one or perhaps two degrees separated from some extremely powerful people. And they are people. They are people who can be challenged, who can be engaged to give, to change the way their corporations run, to change the way their votes go. We are all agents of that change, both in our jobs and our lives and with the people that we touch. Because the people on the other side of the world, the people on the other side of the city or the people just down the street, those people that we're just talking about in the Sudan or Afghanistan whose schools are firebombed, they're waiting for schools they need water, they need hope, they need opportunities to move forward in life. They don't need us to get paralyzed by the enormity of our reports or the, 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 the hardship of the path that lies ahead of us. So if we take anything from this panel, let's take energy. Let's take a desire to move out as a force to engage the people that we know with knowledge 
and to address the structures. Okay, thank you for that encouragement. And Catherine, final word? The moral, the ethical imperative to address these issues of poverty is something that almost everyone on this panel has highlighted. Uh, I would emphasize that it is both an issue of caring of the heart and of compassion, but it's also an issue of rights and justice, uh, a question of the uh, correcting the imbalances in the world to which uh, several have alluded. And even, which has not been very much mentioned here, of self-interest, that if these issues of the vast gulf and the unfulfilled hopes of billions in the world are not addressed. Uh, there is no security and there is no safety for any of us or for our children. So we have an ethical imperative. We have an extraordinarily difficult challenge. It's a possible challenge. It's a possible dream. But it's one that requires our intellectual and our organizational forces. We really need to be willing to deal with the complexity of how you deal with conflict, how you deal with corruption, how you deal with education systems, how you deal with the economies and finance. I want to leave us with two other issues that, that I hope that this group uh, and that you uh, will address in the future that have not been as much mentioned uh, in this discussion. Um, the first one and the main dividing issue between many religious communities and many in the development community is gender. Uh, and the fact that changing relationships between men and women are really a revolution of our times. And they are extraordinarily complex and they are demanding. But the equality of people, and men and women are the largest single groups, is a fundamental principle. And it is one that many have not come to terms with as to what it means. The fact that there are over 100 million missing girls that are not alive uh, because of neglect uh, or, or because of uh, they, were, they were eliminated is a telling symbol of the fact that we are very far from coming to terms with what gender equality means. And religions play a very central role in those attitudes for many different reasons. The second issue uh, that, that is beyond the caring about hungry people, about the child who's not in school, is the much more complex issue of equity and balance. So how much inequity, how much inequality is all right? Uh, how much, how do we balance creativity, competition, individual freedom with the enormous gulfs that are so visible uh, between the haves and the have-nots in our world. And how do we reflect, how do we bring our intellectual and our ethical resources to bear on thinking about those problems in a much more intelligent way in the future? So to, at some level, the poverty issue is more crucial, more important, a greater imperative. But in many respects, unless we come to terms with these issues of equity and balance and fairness, uh, it will be difficult to come to the, to the tougher problems of poverty that are the ones that are still before us. OK, thank you. Glad you mentioned that first issue of um, uh, women and gender uh, equity. That's going to be the subject of the next issue of Reflections, as a matter of fact. So we will be following along on uh, some of those conversations. I want to give a word of thanks to all of the members of the panel for a stimulating uh, conversation tonight, and I hope it will be useful to all of you and to all of those who are going to uh, read and use Reflections uh, to push the conversation along and to do things with the, uh, in meeting some of these challenges of world poverty. Uh, we're going to, as a token of our um, affection and esteem for the members of the panel, give all of them a little, um, uh, a little um, gift here that will re uh, remind them of this night. It uh, should make a nice uh, hanging on their walls. I'm not going to try to give them out here because it's just too complicated with all of this panel, but uh, everyone here is going to get one of these. And we're also going to give one to uh, Joe Donnelly. Is Joe Donnelly here? Joe, uh, please come forward and we'll give you this, uh, give you this one. 
Joe from Caritas International has been extraordinarily helpful in setting up the logistics of this event, and he's also been um, an advisor to uh, John and Ray Waddle and the people who put this magazine together on this issue and on many others. So thank you very much. Let me also say a word of thanks to the people who put this evening together. First of all, to, to Ray Waddle, uh, the editor of Reflections. Ray, take a bow. And to the uh, many staff members who are here who put together the, uh, the reception that will follow momentarily. To John Lindner and Connie Royster. To Gail Briggs, our director of alumni relations. Here's Connie right here, Gail in the back. Uh, Joanne Van Flack uh, was here earlier. Is Joanne there? Yes, Joanne. And uh, Sandy Lynch came in uh, from the business side of the, the Divinity School to lend a hand here, too. So we've had a good team working on this. Uh, thank you all for being here, and uh, I look forward to having conversations with many of you, as uh, does the panel here as well. Yes. Because I kept my, I tried to keep my comments very short, I didn't get to do my adverti advertising. Our um, Jubilee USA's website is www.jubileeusa.org. <laughs> and I also have in the back a sign-up sheet, so we would really encourage people to sign up.